everyone, and welcome to our webinar today discussing the human microbiome and COVID-19, how the pandemic is reshaping your research. My name is Laura Cunningham, and I am a microbiome product manager at d and Genotech, and I'm delighted to be moderating this session. I think it will be a great discussion as COVID has really affected all our lives in every possible way, including our research. Participating in the webinar today is Dr. Paul Wishmeyer and Dr. Marcel Van Duel. Thank you both for joining. Dr. Paul Wishmeyer is a critical care perioperative and nutrition physician who ser serves as a professor with tenure of anesthesiology and surgery at Duke University School of Medicine. Dr. Wishmeyer's clinical and research focuses on helping patients prepare and recover from acute illness and surgery. Dr. Marcel Van Duo is a postdoctoral fellow in the lab of Jerry Giesbrecht in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Calgary. The main focus of his studies is on the role of the gut microbiome in, in, in infant behavior and neurodevelopment throughout early life. Okay, so to run this webinar, we're using this new platform and we wanna encourage everyone to take control of their dashboards. So at the bottom of your screen, you will find multiple application engagement tools you can use. All the engagement tools are resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to get the most out of your desktop space. You can expand your slide or maximize it to full screen by clicking on the arrows at the top right-hand corner. You will also notice a resource icon, so please click on that icon to download helpful links that will complement today's presentation. If you need any technical help, feel free to click the question mark icon at any time. So today, we will be hearing from both speakers about their specific research studies, which will be followed by a theme discussion, and then we will open it up to general Q&A. A few housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, so first off, this webinar is being recorded and will be made available to participants post-meeting. Your video and sound has been turned off, but we encourage participants to use the Q&A function. And before I pass things over to our first speaker, I'm actually going to release four short poll questions. So please fill out these questions, and then we'll review the responses at the start of the discussion section. Okay, so here we go. Question number one. Should be released on your screen. So if you could take a few seconds to reply. got question number two and then question number three and then number four should be yeah on your screen now okay perfect so thank you for I'm taking the time to fill out the poll questions. Uh, and without further ado, I'm going to um, pass things over to our first speaker. So over to you, Marcel. Super, thank you so much. <clears throat> so um, my name is Marcel Van Duau. I'm in the, the lab of Dr. Jerry Giesbrecht. And I'll, I'll first start sort of introducing this particular cohort that we're, that we're working on. Um, and it's, it's really focused on pregnancy during the COVID-19 pandemic. So during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, a variety of countermeasure measures were launched to sort of restrain the spread of the COVID, uh, of the COVID uh, virus, uh, which include, for instance, physical distancing, but also closing of workspaces. And this in turn has resulted in quite a bit of objective hardship, um, for instance, loss of job, an increase in workloads, or even a reduction in social supports, uh, which in turn has resulted in um, a lot of prenatal stress. Um, this is obviously quite important because prenatal stress has been associated with elevated levels of anxiety and depression during pregnancy. But not only that, pregnancy is also a really important time window where uh, prenatal stress can also result in the elevated risk of neuro neurodevelopmental and mental health disorders for the, for the babies, for the offspring. Um, so this is a really sort of critical time point because of that. Um, so the overarching sort of aim of the entire cohort is really to try to investigate 
how does stress caused by the COVID-19 pandemic affect psychological distress in pregnant individuals, but also developmental outcomes in their offspring? Um, briefly talking a bit about the participant recruitment. So recruitment was done mostly using Facebook and Instagram, um, after which participants could um, enroll themselves, provide consent and, and fill in questionnaires uh, using RedCap. Um, and then the inclusion criteria was being older than 70, 17 years old, um, lower than 35 weeks of gestation, living in Canada, and being able to read and write English or French. And this has resulted in over 10,000 participants being enrolled in the study already. Um, and, and just to show you a, a general spread of the entire cohort, we see that throughout Canada, we've got quite a nice spread in all the different uh, provinces, essentially, which is, which is really nice to see. Uh, our study has already shown that rates of psychological distress among pregnant individuals have increased three to five fold over pre-pandemic levels, as can be seen here in the blue and in the red dot compared to the, the, the green dots. Um, the question then becomes, well, what role does a microbiome play in such a cohort and, and play in all these research questions. And there's been a growing emphasis on the bi-directional communication between the gut microbiome and the brain, which has been sort of coined the microbiome, the gut brain axis. And, and specifically relevant to our research, um, it has already been shown that anxiety and depressive disorders are associated with um, changes in specific bacterial taxa. And, and functionally, this may be then linked to um, alterations in, in a variety of metabolites produced by the microbiome, uh, of which potentially short-chain fatty acid levels uh, or, for instance, GABA synthesis might be altered in these conditions. So having established um, that there is this, that, that the good microbiota um, may play an important role during pregnancy, um, it's also important to note that there's this sort of it, it, it may also play a role during neurodevelopment. So it's sort of important for the same entire pathway that we're trying to investigate already in, in our cohorts. Um, going further into the specifics of, of our research question and, and what we're really trying to tackle uh, with our microbiome research, the circumstances formed by the COVID-19 pandemic allow for a unique approach for investigating the effects of stress exposure and resilience as well. So. Um, sort of taking it back to this to this first slide where the COVID-19 pandemic results in countermeasures, objective hardship and prenatal stress. What we also see in our cohort is that some individuals have elevated anxiety and depression scores, whereas other individuals still have relatively normal anxiety and depression scores. So what we're trying to then do is, is see, well, how does the what we hope to do in the future then is how do the how does the good microbiota, microbiota compare between these sort of stress susceptible and stress resilience measures? Additionally, considering that stress resilience and susceptibility has a lot of different components as well that go well beyond the good microbiome. So really, in the bigger scheme of things, we hope to identify good microbiome markers associated with stress resilience, um, which may ultimately inform intervention studies for supporting mental health during pregnancy and also early life neurodevelopments. Um, talking a bit more about the sort of sampling procedures. Um, typically, we just send out an invitation email to a lot of participants. They are able, may provide consent through RedCap if they want to. Um, if they provide consent, we will send them a sort of sampling kit uh, with all the materials through the post. They will provide do at home sampling and then participants will just send the samples back through the post as well. And, and using this um, sort of methodology, we've gotten almost 400 stool samples from pregnant individuals during the third trimester uh, for, for both good microbiome and metabolomics. Um, and then taking a step further, from we were also sampling at ba from babies at three months of age, uh, for which we have 475 stool samples at the present moment. Thinking about biosampling beyond the microbiome that we're doing as well, um, at the third trimester time, time point, we're also collecting hair for retrospective cortisol analyses. Um, and additionally, from the babies, we're co collecting cheek swaps so we can actually look at DNA methylations for our markers also related to stress. And then more recently, we started um, our uh, dried blood spot collection, uh, which will allow us to detect 
COVID-19 antibodies and, and then really look at other things, um, essentially. But overall, it's, it's a tremendous cohort. And there's a lot of people behind the scenes, well, not behind the scenes, but also obviously at the forefront. Um, and yeah, I, I just want to say thank you to our amazing team. They are instrumental in, in being able to sort of make this happen. And I'm, I'm really appreciative uh, yeah, of their amazing work. Uh, and I would also like to say thank you to Western Family Foundation, who is who's providing us with funding so that we can actually do this type of research. Uh, and then with that, that is the end of my presentation. And I would like to give it over to, to Paul. Thank you so much. Ooh, sorry. Thank you. That was great. Really excellent work. Let's see if I can get my screen shared here for everyone. Okay, is everyone seeing that? Maybe you can tell me. Looks good, Looks good Paul. Okay. Great, thank you. So I wanna talk briefly with you today about some of the research we're doing here at Duke University. Um, and we're looking at the role of probiotics and, and ultimately the role the microbiome plays in the prevention and treatment of COVID-19 and the ongoing and planned trials we have here. Let me see if I can get my remote working. So of course, as we all know that um, I, I serve as largely as a critical care physician and, and researcher, and often in the ICU, we're trying to eradicate bacteria, and we're, we, we use uh, large amounts of antibiotics to, to treat what we perceive to be bacterial pathogens, and I think most of the world thinks of bacteria as pathogens, but of course, those of us who do microbiome research, I've always tried to share the message that really your, your microbiome and your bacteria are 100 trillion friends that you didn't know you had, and friends you want to keep around and perhaps add to. And so I think we have tried a, a great deal in, in the medical field and with our patients in particular to show them that actually giving back bacteria, whether it be through stool transplants or, or probiotics or, or other um, maybe at-home remedies, um, we can not only uh, prevent disease, but maybe treat disease and actually prevent infections, including COVID-19 infections. And the day may come we're actually prescribing bacteria um, I know some of you probably may be aware that the MIT students will sell you their poop and tell you that it makes you smarter. Um, the FDA has some challenges with that. But nonetheless, the idea that we can treat and prevent disease by manipulating the microbiome is becoming very real. And so we've been very passionate in our research about understanding what's in the guts of both our ICU patients, our surgical patients, and, and now potentially at-risk COVID patients, and whether that can help or hurt them if we can change that. So I, I work in a COVID-19 ICU, and I care for many, many, many COVID-19 patients, and they are the sickest patients I've ever cared for in my entire ICU career of more than 20 years. And so they're exceedingly challenging. And through some of the research we've done that, that we've published in the past, we've shown that critical illness by itself and infectious illness like COVID-19 can um, disturb the balance of the microbiome and, and the needed diversity that our guts require, and that perhaps probiotics and other interventions can put that back. And the idea of resodding the lawn that's blighted by illness, we have data, of course, that COVID-19 subjects who become critically ill or have the most severe disease are being found to have the most disturbed microbiomes when they get sick. And those high risk factors for severe COVID disease like hypertension and obesity lead to subjects who already have disturbed microbiomes and they tend to have the worst COVID-19 disease and end up in my ICU and other ICUs around the country. And so the idea that we can change that through probiotics and manipulate the microbiome is very real. And there's science to this. We know that when patients become sick, that their gut microbiome changes and the normal commensal beneficial bacteria begin to disappear. Um, and this leads to the, the growth of sort of the pathogens, the bad guys in the gut um, who bring their rowdy bad guy friends, much like when a hurricane hits a city and everyone leaves and looters come and they bring their looter friends. Um, when the normal folks of the gut leave, uh, the bad guys come. And the idea that you could replete that by giving back probiotics or their commensal flora and prevent subsequent complications and disease um, is becoming very real. And so there's many mechanisms by which probiotics may prevent not only bacterial infections, but viral infections um, that, that we, we've explored in our lab and many other labs. And we know that probiotics themselves can prevent 
viral adhesion. They actually secrete antiviral proteins. They maintain the mucus barrier against invasion and, and many other things. And this is some of the science we've done, specifically looking at pneumonia and lung injury just briefly. We've shown that if you give probiotics before very severe pneumonias like pseudomonas, of course, which is a very severe pneumonia we face, you can significantly improve survival in animals when you give it at the time of the pneumonia onset. And in fact, you can prevent the growth entirely of the pseudomonas that you've injected into the trachea. We give a large dose, a lethal dose of pseudomonas. But if you give a probiotic, you can prevent that. So this is the bacterial growth in the blood and in the lungs, we also measured, um, of animals that didn't get probiotics. And this is, you can see no growth in the animals that got lactobacillus GG or some of the other probiotics we've studied. And the lung injury is much reduced as well. In the lower left-hand corner, you can see how severe the pneumonia is. And then this is what normal lung architecture looks like in the animals that got probiotics. And so immune response actually is affected by the probiotics as well. And we think that's part of the protection. We know COVID-19 disease actually leads to lung injury because of the immune response it evokes. And we know that if you can have a strong T regulatory cell response, which is a protective response that attenuates some of that overactive immune response, you can improve the survival from other forms of pneumonia. And we were able to show that probiotics actually increase these beneficial T regulatory cells that attenuate this severe response to an invading pathogen like COVID-19. This was an, uh, an anab or a pseudomonas pneumonia model. And so again, the pneumonia you can see in that bar that's very low there leads to a loss of these key T reg cells and they lack to bacillus and the, and the other probiotics can bring it back. But of course, clinical science is needed. Basic science is not enough. And there's a lot of clinical data for the benefits of probiotics. This is just one large meta-analysis of 12,000 subjects for antibiotic associated diarrhea. Giving probiotics reduces that by 40% in these patients. Doesn't seem to matter which probiotic you give, any commensal will outgrow the pathogens and allow for the restoration of normal bacterial flora. In patients like COVID-19 patients at risk for further bacterial pneumonias, which is what's leading to the deaths of lots of our patients, an NIH-funded trial showed lactobacillus GG could reduce virulent associated pneumonia by half in these very sick ICU patients. This was an NIH-funded trial um, that, that is one of the real strong trials in our area, and this was also in the intention to treat analysis. It reduced C. diff diarrhea as well, so it seemed this can be very clinically relevant. My group's done meta-analysis data of all the ICU trials, and we show that probiotics have real benefits in infectious risk. And the sicker you are, the more benefited you are. And we think that's because we've, and we've shown this, the microbiome is more disturbed when you're sicker and probiotics are likely to help more. And so these are all the trials that went into that. You can see significant reductions um, in infection in patients who get probiotics. And this is true in elective surgery, trauma, and, and lots of other illnesses as well. And then, of course, this is perhaps the most important trial ever done in probiotic research. It was published in Nature, The Nature, a um, very large trial done in India where they looked at thousands, 4,000 full-term healthy infants who got a lactobacillus plus a prebiotic versus a uh, control, and they found dramatic reductions in respiratory tract infections, sepsis, or bloodstream infections and death in the patients that got the probiotic, prebiotic, symbiotic combination. So again, a dramatic treatment effect published in one of the premier journals in the world of giving probiotics. And so we believe this may have a large impact on viral respiratory infection prevention as well, like COVID-19. And so again, we, we there's data for this in the Cochrane review showing that probiotics can reduce upper respiratory infections in normal folks by 47% when they're given uh, to adults and in children as well, and that they can reduce the length of the illness or the severity of the illness by as much as two days. And so again, and this is just one other meta-analysis of many 10,000 patients that pre and probiotics can have significant reductions in respiratory tract infections. And so we need clinical trials urgently. And so we have been engaged or are planning multiple trials. And I think the one I'll, I'll tell you about is the prevention of COVID-19 infection in people and their families or their caregivers. So when someone gets tested positive for COVID-19 in their home, um, we're studying the role of lactobacillus GG and preventing other members of the home and we'll enroll the whole family um, from getting COVID-19. And this is our trial, the PROTECT EHC trial. Um, and so we, this is our website that we've been recruiting with. And the idea is, is that we're giving a lactobacillus versus a control. Um, we have a, a clinicals.gov listing. Obviously, we have an IND to do this from the FDA. So the FDA approved this IND. Um, and so, again, we're, we're running an FDA-approved um, probiotic trial. And it was a challenge to get that IND, actually. And it's, we have quite a study timeline. We recruit people. We've started by recruiting people um, from all the positive patients with um, COVID-19 at Duke. We've called over 9,000 patients in the last about 
nine to 10 months. Um, and we actually send them, it's all online, it's all by mail. We send them a microbiome collection kit for uh, three different microbiome collection time points and nasal swab for uh, COVID PCR. And then we send them 28 days worth of, of probiotics and they fill out surveys uh, for their symptoms weekly. And so again, these are the different things. We, we get a lot of information from them, including stool collection and nasal swab collection. Uh, and we, they've been very good actually about returning these kits and we give them a financial incentive. So, um, and then, so we're very interested not only in does the probiotic prevent the risk of infection, but we wanna understand what does your baseline microbiome do to your risk of getting COVID-19? Maybe there's protective microbiomes what is the effect of COVID-19 disease severity on disease per and progression if you have a, perhaps a diverse microbiome versus a non-diverse microbiome? And then are there certain microbiomes that probiotics are more likely to help to prevent COVID-19 infection as well as progression and severity? Because we think different baseline microbiomes will respond differently to probiotics and respond differently to COVID-19 infection and the severity of disease. We've enrolled 180 patients thus far, um, including 40 children. So we'll enroll down to age one. Um, we're enrolling whole families when we're able, but, but enrollment has been very challenging in this trial. Um, we, we, we've tried a lot of different modalities. Again, we've called, that number actually is about 10,000 now. I haven't updated this slide yet. We've called almost 10,000 patients at Duke. We've been featured on a number of local TV news interviews, which does bump enrollment. And then we've used Facebook and Google ads to not much success. And then this group called Trial Facts is a professional recruitment organization we're paying to help us recruit. And that's helped recruitment pick up some, but any insights and, and ideas any of you have for recruitment, we'd like to hear. And these are the things we've done. And I'm happy to talk more about that. So in closing, what have we learned so far? The healthy gut is a diverse gut. And that illness and Western diet and industrialization have set us up to have COVID-19 pandemics because it set us up to not be ready to deal with these kinds of infections. And that associates with severe disease and poor outcomes. And we need to correct this. And with probiotics, we believe we can. And we believe we can change the world, even the world living in now with the pandemic. And that probiotics can really have a major effect in treating COVID-19 and perhaps future pandemics that we may face as, our, as, as humankind. And so, again, I think the idea that we can actually give back back here as a primary treatment is real. And we hope to be able to prove that by resodding the lawn with probiotics and restoring balance to our patients. Right. It's it's not all in your head. Healthy head and happiness um, start in your gut. And we, we really believe that's true. And. We hope we can make this so easy a child can do it by making enrollment and collection simple and understandable. So with that, um, have, feel free to reach out. We, we post a lot about our work on Twitter and Instagram and feel free to email me as well. And um, if you have anyone you can share this website with or anyone you know who might benefit from our trial, please share our website. You can enroll all online. So I look forward to our discussion. Thanks very much. That's great. Thanks. I think I just want to stop sharing your screen. Perfect. And, um, let's see if I can. There we go. I think I got it. Perfect. Okay, great. So I uh, thank you both. Um, so to start off the discussion, I'm really hoping these poll questions worked. Um, so we can just re review the results quickly. Um, I think it'll probably be a good starting point to, to start off the discussion. Um, so first question, awesome. How has COVID-19 impacted your microbiome project? Um, so no impact is the largest, 32%, okay. Um, we've got split on per project proceeding with challenges um, and project on pause. Uh, and then we've got 20% that did pivot uh, to include COVID-19. Great, okay. Um, question two, for those projects proceeding with challenges, what have you faced? Check all that applies. So uh, the winner here, inability to collect biological samples. Okay. Um, decreased recruitment, obviously, big one too, and then none of the above. Okay, great. Question three, have you had to change your study participant recruitment plans due to COVID-19? So winner here is yes, they've had to. So the majority have had to change plans. Makes sense. Um, and then our last question, um, just touching on recruitment, seems to be a pretty, pretty big theme. Um, which recruitment methods have you tried? So this will be really interesting. Um, we've got 36.7 email, 30% website, 13 Facebook ads, Google ads. There are also 13 other social media, 20 TV, 10%, print 6.7, good old print, phone calls, 23 
Uh, blast texting, three, okay, recruitment and healthcare settings, 16, and 6.7 recruitment agencies. Okay, so really widespread here, really interesting. Um, but email seems to be, I guess, the best here. Um, so that's good. So I guess, um, Paul, Marcel, just, just based on these four um, poll questions here, I guess, just curious to know your thoughts. Are you surprised by any of these responses? I don't think so. I think, you know, all of us realize that COVID-19 would very rapidly change a lot of our research and what we can and can't do. And I think it also pushed a lot of us to realize sort of this is one of the great challenges of our age. And, you know, much like our, our, our grandparents, you know, their great challenge was, was a world war. COVID-19, perhaps, especially for those of us in the healthcare and research scientific fields, this was our great challenge to come to. And so I wasn't surprised to see a lot of people pivoting to COVID research. The hard part is, though, you know, it made everything much more difficult in some ways. And I think recruitment, you can see the whole range of strategies people have tried. I, I can say we moved to recruitment strategies I've never imagined trying. And, and so I'd be curious to hear people talk more about what has worked and what hasn't. Um, you know, we've had some pretty good success for recruitment agencies, but in talking to other large COVID-19 trial PIs around the country and around the world, those who could get a national media news break or like get onto a, a popular television show, a morning news show or CNN, um, or have someone sort of very famous talk about their trial, those are the people who had the very best luck. Um, so I'm curious where people have had luck and, and, and not had luck. We, we've had some pretty good luck recently with our specified clinical trial recruitment agency, but that takes some investment. So I'll be curious what others have done. Mm -hmm. um, Marcel, you have anything to add? Um, yeah, I, I, that makes a little sense. I completely agree. Uh, and to maybe add on to that, even even something smaller like this this week, our our study cohort re re released a newsletter, and they specifically mentioned that we were still looking for uh, individuals who were infected with COVID nineteen during pregnancy, so that we can hopefully sort of follow up how their children develop. Um, and even something as simple as such a newsletter uh, has has dramatically increased sort of the uptake of that particular group and. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really such kind of like out not outreach, but um, such such meth recruitment methods that can really bolster uh, recruitment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so on that note, um, and Paul's kind of question right to the audience, and we want to try to be as engaging as possible. There is one other poll question that we can release. Um, you know, talking about all of the recruitment methods that you know are displayed on this screen. Um, which has been the most successful. So we can pull the audience again and get that information and then we can kind of comment. Um, I'm hoping I can do this. So I'm going to release this. So audience, there's another poll question coming your way. We'll just give you, um, you know, 15 seconds or so. Oh. Oh. Is it ready to go back? Yes. I don't know if that worked. It just changed automatically on me. There we go. Okay, so hopefully people have some time here to respond to this. And then there's another question that we can use for the discussion as well, just in terms of um, sample challenges. Okay, so, okay, we got, out of the recruitment methods you've tried, so which ones are the most successful? So again, we've got email coming as a clear winner, so 50%, website 12.5, print 12.5, recruitment and healthcare setting 25%. So here we've got email actually being, um, being the clear winner. Which I don't know, Paul. How do you feel about that? Knowing all of, you know all of the different methods that you've tried. Yeah, um. <laughs> yeah. That, that's interesting. I, I I'd love to hear more about how the email worked. You know, for us, it was challenging um, because it wasn't always easily accessible for us to have emails. You know, we're recruiting COVID positive patients, and uh, so we often didn't have emails for them. 
Um, and then we're also recruiting nationally and even internationally as well. And so, you know, our targets, we needed to reach, you know, people we actually didn't have identifications for other than potentially uh, clearly the 9,000, 10,000 people at Duke that we we had phone numbers for so we could call them. So I think it really depends on your trial. You know, email wasn't really a, a viable option for us because we, we actually didn't have target population emails available to us, but but clearly some people did, and I think that's brilliant. Um, and then, you know, our website clearly was instrumental. And then for us, phone calls, and I, the, the, the program wasn't letting me answer. I think I'm logged in in such a way I can't answer the questions, but phone calls were, were our, our strength. And then these recruitment agency that we've engaged who they're using social media strategies, but they're experts in social media strategies have been recently successful, even as COVID numbers begin to drop, we're, we're increasing our enrollment that way. And then clearly TV worked. When we got on TV, we got more patients. So we always got bumps from that. Awesome. Okay, great. Sorry, my son, did I cut you off? Oh, yeah, oh no, sorry, sorry. Um, and then potentially also, so, so our sort of main successful recruitment strategies are mostly Facebook and Instagram. And, and I think that might then also relate to your specific population characteristics, because one can imagine if you're, you're pregnant, that's something that Facebook and Instagram is able to sort of pick up relatively easily um, and then provide targeted ads. And, and there's quite a long period of time through which an individual is pregnant, well, typically nine months, essentially. Um, so then I imagine makes things like Facebook and in Instagram a lot more feasible where you can imagine with you, Paul, you have a very specific time window. And the moment somebody has a COVID-19 infection, they're not going to look on Facebook and Instagram to, to figure out what they're actually going to do. Um, so because of that, potentially different recruitment strategies suit better for very specific populations as a, as a result of that. What do you think? Yeah, for sure. Timing, I think is really important because um, you're right. We One of our challenges, obviously, is we have a very narrow window of enrollment. We need to enroll them, their family within three days of the person turning positive so that we have a chance to prevent further infection. And so about half the phone calls we make, uh, by the time we actually reach people, they're already out of the window um, because it, it takes some period of time for the test to come back and then some period of time for us to reach them. So I think the timing of, of research is, uh, of your research is also very important and, and, and how quickly you need to enroll people or, or if you have a much bigger window, I think it makes a, a really nice, um, it makes a really nice opportunity then to, to have a more broad exposure like email and other places where timing is so important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and Paul, you mentioned that you're compensating participants and you don't have to answer this question if you don't want to, but for those that might, you know, are in a similar position and they're considering, you know, compensation for their study participants, um, yep. is there like a, a dollar, what dollar value did you have to get to, to, you know, that it's worth people's time to, to participate? Yeah, sure. So we, you know, we have three, um, Collect, uh, sample collection endpoints, um, their, their baseline, which is before they start taking the probiotics or the control, uh, they have a day seven and a day 28. And so if they send all three back, they get $40. Um, and so we do $10 for each endpoint, and then to incentivize them doing all the endpoints, they get a total of $40, so they get an additional $20 for the last endpoint if they send that in and have sent in the other two. Great. And that does seem to have helped a little bit. I think our our, our return on, and, and it's not been as great as we'd like. I mean, I think we'd like to have gotten a higher percentage of returns than we have, but, and we've done pretty well. But I, but that did help when we started that. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. We, so, we've been, uh, sorry. No, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, our incentives were, were our, it's interesting to hear the incentives because our tend to be in this very similar time uh, sort of range as well, where for stool sampling is typically 20 Canadian dollars that are provided as an incentive. Hair is 10, and then for the cheek swaps uh, for the infants at three months old, it's also sort of, um, it's also $20. So it's, it's interesting to hear sort of these, these similar um, sort of incentives as well. Yeah. Well, that's great. Um, so kind of just general question then, you know, um, why pivot microbiome studies to include COVID-19? And um, question from the audience to you is, can you outline the link between microbiome and COVID-19? So, 
So I think one reason we pivoted was all research outside of COVID-19 research was really um, almost put on hold uh, last, you know, a year ago, March. And so I think one, because we felt a professional duty to, uh, to, you know, move this forward and address the pandemic itself, but also because again, they limited almost all of our other research, all my nutrition and metabolism research within the ICU moved to COVID-19 uh, definitions of the, the metabolic response to it as well. But, but I think um, the links I, are growing between the microbiome and COVID-19. And um, we submitted some grants we submitted where, where we sort of worked this out. And I think one of the things we found that's really interesting is, is there's a link between um, gut dysbiosis and, for instance, the ACE receptor. Um, gut levels, gut dysbiosis increases levels of the ACE2 target of SARS-CoV-2 and increase um, ACE2 al allows for SARS-CoV-2 to enter more readily. Um, and again, we've seen a lot of GI COVID. In fact, we have patients that test positive for COVID in their stool that don't test positive in their exhaled breath or in, the, in their in their nasal samples, I'm sorry. Um, so they're not exhaling necessarily or having it in their nose, um, but they have it in their stool. And, and in fact, um, a lot of the high risk disease groups um, clearly show a greater risk uh, of COVID-19 like hypertension and obesity also have the, some of the worst um, dysbiosis. And so again, one of the other things they've shown was increased levels of commensal species like lactobacillus correlates with higher anti-inflammatory L10 levels and improved COVID-19 disease prognosis, uh, increased levels of pro-inflammatory bacterial species or, or, or dysbiosis like Klebsiella and Rheumococcus um, is correlated with elevated levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines and increased COVID-19 disease severity. And again, there's a lot of initial small, small studies, but they're highlighting that that COVID-19 patients commonly experience severe gut dysbiosis, and these microbiome changes are being proven to associate with disease severity um, and dysbiosis that persists even after they've cleared their SARS-CoV-2. So these long COVID patients likely are showing, and, and we'll need more research to prove this, but they're showing prolonged dysbiosis, um, and so there may be prolonged harm to the, to the human microbiome. Um, and again, they've looked at some deaths. They've looked at some pathology specimens from patients who died of COVID-19, and there are significant decreases in lactobacilli and increased pathogens in patients who die of COVID-19. Um, and so, again, when you combine that with what we know that the commensal microbiome does <laughs> to, the influ to its influence on lung immunity, there's, there's really a, a large and quickly growing literature that show that there may be some really interesting connections between the microbiome and risk for COVID-19 that I think we can, we can learn more about and try to address. Marcel, anything to add? Um, yes, yes, actually, thank you. Um, <laughs> I, and more from from our perspective, I thinking about sort of the mental health implications of our research. Um, often, I do have to recognize that whatever research I do may not directly benefit our participants that we're investigating now. Uh, but very often, when we when we think about sort of these pandemics or, or nationwide disasters, they can allow for very specific influences to be investigated. So just to give a, a different example, uh, at the end of the Second World War, there was the Dutch hunger winter where the, uh, where, the, where the Germans sort of took all the foods from a Dutch population, and this resulted in an extreme shortage of food during that time. Um, and, and specifically pregnant people are, were hit very hard as well during that time. Um, and what they then started to do is sort of follow the, the infants from that pregnancy throughout the years. And suddenly what they started to notice over the years was that body weight and, and rates of obesity, obesity were higher. Uh, and there were of course similar um, changes in, in, in relation to specific biomarkers related to obesity as well. Um, and that's sometimes how I try to view this cohort that, that we have, where potentially this specific environment that the COVID-19 pandemic uh, presents to us provides us with a, a unique opportunity to, to investigate similar mechanisms or, or similar aspects uh, of influence during pregnancy 
where we can really understand which which influences during pregnancy can have these outcomes on, on the infants throughout the next few years so that we also gain, gain a, a, a further understanding and appreciation of, of sort of what's happening during pregnancy. And some of the, the aspects I think that we're really trying to target here is this aspects of, of distress essentially and this environment of elevated anxiety and depression where some individuals may be more resilient to this than others and then try to see, well, how can we further understand this particular aspects specifically in relation to the, the pandemic, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay, thanks. Um, and then another theme that's very common across both your um, studies is, you know, collecting multiple ohms, if you will, or, or multiple sample types, right? Um, mm. So I guess the question then for discussion is, you know, like comment on the importance of, you know, collecting, you know, multiple sample types or from multiple ohms. Yeah, I mean, so, I, I think that's oh, a, yeah, yeah, no, go ahead. Oh, yeah, so for, for us, it's really the different sample types are what allows us to, to investigate different research questions, essentially. So for us, uh, obviously, stress exposure, very important. Uh, suitability for us to collect hair and then look at cortisol levels retrospectively is, is amazing, essentially. And I think I've gained a lot of appreciation and, and more knowledge about the different sam like sampling methods and biosamples that can be taken um, from far away and, and using at-home sampling. For instance, dried blood spot sampling, I wouldn't have even have imagined would be possible before the pandemic started. So I, I definitely learned a lot from that perspective. Uh, Paul? Yeah, I, I agree. You know, we we felt it essential to not only get the microbiome, obviously, but but we realized that there would be people that would acquire asymptomatic COVID nineteen, and we really wanted to know about that, <clears throat> which is why we're collecting nasal swabs from those uh, subjects as well as microbiome, because there's a real opportunity, right? That if probiotics say are effective, perhaps the patient still. Um, acquire COVID-19, but never show symptoms because of the effects of probiotics that we know on attenuating the inflammatory response and preventing sort of the severity of illness that we suspect that we've seen in other infectious um, areas with, with uh, probiotics. So we really wanted to be sure <clears throat> we were also capturing the asymptomatic folks who maybe never would have presented for testing um, in the routine setting because they weren't, they didn't have any symptoms. You know, we, we, the blood spot testing is interesting. We've entertained that idea as well. And I think we're still talking about what, is that something we'd want to add to uh, some subset of patients to look at the antibody and even inflammatory markers. And, you know, I love the antibody idea. We hadn't considered that, um, but we did consider looking at inflammatory markers and other things. And just because of the challenges that we already have in enrollment, we, we were challenged to, to, to add additional endpoints to the research for fear it might hurt enrollment of the actual clinical trial itself, but I, I think that's brilliant. You know, I think the other piece that we would love to be able to do is be able to do metabolomics, and I think, you know, the creation of kits by, by Genotech and other, other companies, but, but I think Genotech's got a good one right now of kits that can not only serve to preserve the microbiome, um, 16S analysis, but also serve in a way to allow us to do metabolomics I think is really essential. And, and, and we, we I think, are really interested in making sure we do that as well. There's another project we're doing called the Thousand Patient Surgery Project. We're collecting all omics sequentially on a thousand surgery patients, different types. Um, <clears throat> and we're using multi-omic collection techniques that Genetics helped us a lot with to do that. And so I think in all of our studies, these are really essential. So we're doing metabolomics, genomics, proteomics, um, inflammatory markers, and all those other kinds of things in our surgery patients. So. Awesome. I think it's well, that's great to hear. Yeah. Yeah. So this kind of like brings me like it, it flows nicely into the next kind of question I wanted to ask. And that's, you know, and maybe you kind of touched on it already, but, you know, what will the future of the microbiome space look like now with COVID in our lives and, and what will happen post COVID? Mm -hmm. I, I think from, from our perspective, it's, it's a difficult one because I'm, I'm, making a clear distinction between two recruitment strategies 
uh, and, and sort of study strategies within our particular sort of cohorts, maybe not cohorts, but what, what we're looking at, one can typically do a, a cohort within the same city that you're in and then participants go to, go to your, your, um, your research center, they provide their stool samples, there in like well they take it at home but then provide sort of the the little box with the stool samples there um and one of the the pros there is you have more participants contact and and that sort of stronger bonds makes also make sure that uh there's a higher compliance essentially on the other side if you then use at home sampling and you just send everything to the post and you do all the questionnaires online it does allow you to do sample recruitment outside of your own city and then suddenly mm -hmm. you can do a canada-wide study like like our cohort in this case essentially um, and and we do tend to see that when we send out a lot of recruitment emails not an extreme amount of participants are are responding and what if are willing to uh provide stool samples and that might be also in this sort of connection and this bond is, is not really made yet from that perspective. Um, but then on the other side, we have a lot more participants within the study, we have a lot bigger reach. And and that sort of the, the sort of differentiation that I'm seeing, that I'm noticing in, in sort of the, the way a study can be performed uh, from that perspective. And and the pros and cons obviously to both to both cases because some biosamples obviously you can only take at a hospital like a blood draw. Um, so it does, yeah, there, there are very specific implications, I think, for both strategies. Paul? Hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, I think the future will look very different. I think just in, in the work we're doing here, and I think other, I've talked to others, this concept of, like you said, being able to, I, I work with a group called the Duke Clinical Research Institute that, that did a very large aspirin trial and, and some 20,000 participants looking at two different doses of aspirin that was entirely online. It was, you know, this was four, three, two, three, four years ago, and it was considered revolutionary at the time, this concept of the condensed consent and online consent and all, all these other things, where, where I think now after, you know, the idea that, you know, so much of our meeting and interaction life can happen at from home, I think clinical trials now are going to move significantly as the technologies have evolved very rapidly in the last year to remote trial enrollment, electronic enrollment, electronic consent, red cap data collection. Um, and then like, like, like you said, Marceau, uh, samples being and, and interventions being sent to patients' homes and then samples being returned. I think this is the future of many kinds of clinical research um, that will bring down costs and reach en enormous numbers of, you, you know, to the extent that, 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 Technology is reached even underserved populations around the world, um, and poorer populations. You know, as, as phones and internet proliferate um, in in our world and and all over the world, um, we'll be able to reach participants we've never been able to reach before. Uh, and and so I think you know, COVID clearly is a disease that is ravaging the underserved um, and socioeconomically disadvantaged. And that's definitely true in the U.S. and I think around the world. Um, this may give us an opportunity to maybe reach people that we couldn't reach before. And, and I hope mm -hmm. that proves to be true uh, um, poorly in the past. Awesome. Okay. Um, I'm aware of the time. So we might transition now to some um, audience questions. <sighs> okay. Um, so I'm just looking at the top one here. What is the synergistic, synergistic genetic mechanisms between normal microbiota, microbiota and SARS-CoV-2 after exposure? So I think this is getting at um, sort of the role of the normal microbiome and the role of what probiotics can do um, for patients. And I, and I talked, I answered a question earlier sort of about the, the role of the microbiome um, and and the disturbed the dysbiotic microbiome and and all the data I, I i gave a summary of and some of that information with with anyone who's interested in that but but clearly we as i said before we know that uh dysbiosis um and and deranged microbiome constituencies increase the 
ACE2 receptor expression, at least in the gut and maybe other places of the body as well, which uh, entry of the SARS-CoV-2 into, into our cells and, and to infect us. And then there's a whole range of small studies showing that, that dysbiosis um, is associated with increased severity of disease. And I think then on the con conversely, probiotic interventions clearly are shown to have many mechanisms of protection and benefit um, against an infection like COVID-19 or other viral and bacterial um, and pathogens, both through modification of the immune system, through mucin barrier, through direct antiviral and antibacterial secretion of peptides and other other sort of protective um, agents. Uh, you know, there's there's a whole world of data. My lab and many other labs around the world have have generated. But, but again, I think studies like the study in Nature that was done in India showing even it can be had from taking a, a symbiotic or pre-probiotic combination against infections, especially respiratory infections can have, really tells us we have a huge opportunity to, to share a inexpensive, safe, and rapidly implementable and even sort of very low income populations or third world population intervention uh, by manipulating the microbiome to improve outcomes. And so I think this is a huge opportunity. That's great. So I think the next one is about athletes. Oh, there it is. Um, so it's on the screen. It's on the screen here. Oh, perfect. Um, so Duke University's basketball team was eliminated from the NCAA tournament due to a COVID outbreak. Um, do you have any inroads to the athletic department given the high level of exposure this program receives from the media? Um, and there was a comment from the audience: We're recruiting athletes, and they are extremely motivated to participate. Yeah, we have. We, we've talked about reaching out to to Coach Shevsky and, and even having him promote our study, and, and we still may do that um, as, as, as enrollment gets more and more challenging. Um, you know, I think Duke's athletic program has, has taken the risks of COVID in relation to um, what the period of time that the college athletes spend in their career being college athletes versus the risk of, of infection and, and the risk of losing one's life to this disease, which is unfortunately something we watch every day in our ICUs. Um, and right now, a majority of the patient population in our ICUs that are dying are the 18 to 30 year olds. So um, anyone who's under the illusion that being an 18 to 30 year old um, grants you, um, you you know, marked protection against dying from this disease. That's it's just not true. Um, that, that, that's, that as people are getting vaccinated, this disease variant is getting more aggressive. The the age of the patients in our ICUs who are dying is getting younger and younger every month. Um, but nonetheless, what I what I do think, just as a quick answer, you know, the Duke women's basketball program chose to stop their season before even the men did um, because they didn't think it was worth the risk of exposure to continue. Um, in the grand scheme of looking what the priorities of one's life should be. And I, I think to their credit, they were one of the few groups, the other Ivy League schools I know didn't do um, as much uh, athletics either, but really said, is this the priority that one should be focused on? Unfortunately, I, you know, the men um, weren't able to persist in, in playing either. Um, and so I think, yes, the opportunity to be prophylaxing folks like this uh, with trials, because you're right, they are usually very motivated, um, huge opportunity. And, and I, that's a well-taken point that maybe we should look a little further into. I think we've definitely tried to reach out to students on campus because we've had a lot of student exposures as all colleges had. Um, but it's a challenging population to catch and keep keep uh, focused. But the athletes are an interesting insight. I like that. <laughs> um, okay, next one, um, I think both of you can answer. I'm just gonna push the slide here. Hopefully you guys see that. If not, um, thank you both for the great work. Have you noticed any differences among different ethnic groups? For for our study, so I've been a part in, in the APEN study, which is a uh, Alberta-based study essentially. And and what we're and this is a study before the pandemic. So already in such a cohort, we've noticed that there's a, a really high uptake of uh, Caucasian participants, one might say, um, and, and because of that, a, a very, a relatively lower uptake of, of participants of sort of minorities. Uh, 
Um, and, and similar here, what we're seeing within our study cohort here as well, is that we're seeing a similar pattern where it's mostly Caucasians that are joining the study, whereas minorities um, tend to join the study less. And this is definitely something we try to address. I, I know that um, sort of Jerry and the other PIs of the study have tried to do sort of specific targeted advertising and to try to get more people included from minorities. But even with those efforts, um, it has been challenging to make sure that we have a, a good representative study. Hopefully with high end numbers, we, we can address these questions still. Uh, but this is something that's definitely always on the on the back of our minds. So, yeah, yeah, I, I think we also really try to prioritize that. I can tell you in in the local area in North Carolina, and Durham, North Carolina, where we are, and the and the research triangle, we have a, both a large Hispanic population that is a great risk, and then clearly, um, unfortunately, our African American population makes up a large number of our our, our patients that are, become severely ill. Um, especially um, really what are underserved or lower socioeconomic status patients, they seem to clearly be getting the worst disease. Um, and so I, I think one of the things, obviously, we tried that lots of studies try is we, we have a Spanish website. So um, we have one of our, our, our word research websites that's entirely translated to Spanish. We have a Spanish speaking coordinator who can make these phone calls to our Spanish speaking patients that we're doing routinely. And we have a Spanish consent, of course. And so, you know, we, we've tried to make this study um, applicable or at least reachable by, by that population that, that at least in much of the U.S., obviously, we see a large number of Spanish-speaking patients, and they seem to be particularly hard hit. I think one of the real challenges that that they we have found they face is they wonderfully live in large family units. Obviously, they have a very family-oriented uh, culture, as many cultures are, um, and they tend to live um, with larger numbers of, of people within a single household. Well, the unfortunate part of that is if one person becomes infected, um, sometimes many people become infected because of the exposure that one household member brings. And so th they're a group we've really tried to target. And I haven't seen recently what our demographic breakdown is, but that's a good question. I should see what the update of that is. It, it, I have to admit it, that they're a challenging population. All of all of the industry populations are unfortunately challenging in role. And, and I hope we get better at that and prioritize that more and more because in my ICU care, these are the people I'm watching sort of have the most severe disease, the most severe disability, and the most number of deaths. And, and it's really tragic because you feel like there's things we'd love to be doing to help them. Absolutely. Um, OK, we're going to try to squeeze in one last question. Um, and this one will be for Marcel. Um, the questions, and hopefully it pops up on the screen, but what about the reproductive age group and their fertility status? status after recovering from COVID-19? Hmm. I, I think that's a that's a great question. Um, unfortunately, our study isn't too well positioned to answer this particular question because most of the participants who report the COVID-19 infection um, obviously are already pregnant, typically, or had COVID infection during or after pregnancy. Uh, but Indeed, it would be very interesting to to investigate in the future um, how how this relates to also sort of long COVID and 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 those sort of fertility status sort of slot into there as well. Um, if that answers this, answers the question correctly. Okay, awesome. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone for joining and, and being so engaged. There are tons of questions that we, we couldn't get to, um, but we have them and we'll be sure to follow up post uh, webinar. Um, obviously a big special thank you to our two wonderful speakers. Um, it's been a really great, insightful discussion. Uh, and if you have any additional questions or an interest in, in connecting, um, our contact information is displayed on the screen here. And just a reminder that we'll be sending that follow-up email in the next day or so with the recording. And with that, we're going to sign off. So take care and thank you again for joining. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much. Stay safe. Yes, stay safe. Definitely.